Hello and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Horseshoe Crabs, Keystone to Shorebird Migration and Survival with Dave Brandt, Conservation Director of the Shark Research Institute. Welcome, Dave. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Thank Sanctuary. We're so glad everyone is able to join us today. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally throughout the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, we simply could not do what we do without your support, so thank you. If you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during this time of COVID crisis. And we are so excited to offer our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates any donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website that can directly link you to our YouTube channel. At any time throughout today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Dave Grant is joining us today from New Jersey. And uh, Dave has such a fascinating um, background with so many different professional experiences. I'd like it to take a moment to share some of them with our audience before we get started. As the conservation director of the Shark Research Institute, Dave oversees education, project development, and research programs on fisheries, climate issues, and shifting habitats. He has served as the director of the Ocean Institute at Brookdale College. He has been a marine researcher and station biologist with New Jersey Sea Grant USAID, he has been an instructor for Rutgers University Department of Meteorology and Physical Oceanography. He is a consultant for research and writing. He has done curriculum development for scientific American television series, including for NASA. He has been a ranger with the National Park Service. And he has also spent extensive time at sea on vessels conducting various research projects, including on seabird studies. Wow, Dave, such an interesting background. I have to ask you, how did you first become uh, interested and involved in the field of marine science? Well, uh, in some ways I could say I was homeschooled. We always had a boat and uh, always spent uh, time on that and uh, lived near the water. Uh, and uh, I just uh, kind of grew into that with um, in college and had always uh, hoped to work out at Sandy Hook down at the lower end of New York Harbor. And uh, I was able to do that uh, and make a career of it, so. Wonderful. So what is your personal experience with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? I know I've seen you there a few times. I, I've been a long time uh, member and uh, am uh, well known uh, for uh, annoying naturalists up there with, with uh, <laughs> endless questions. Uh, when I worked with the college, we uh, used to uh, bring an annual bus trip uh, uh, up the mountain in uh, October for the migration. It was always our most popular trip and it always filled. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, I still come up in the fall uh, uh, anyway, when I'm away from Cape May and Sandy Hook, uh, and uh, always enjoy the visits up there. So. Wonderful, well, thank you so much for your support. And I think everyone is really excited to learn more about the connection between horseshoe crabs and shorebirds. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dave, for your presentation. Okay, we're gonna do that then. And, uh, how do we look? Is it, uh, we up and running here? Yep, you're perfect. Good. Well, uh, again, thank you for uh, inviting me up. I would much rather have been up on the mountain today uh, with a live audience 
doing this for a number of reasons. Uh, and uh, including, I usually have uh, prizes for those uh, uh, audience members who uh, come up with the best questions. In this case, some uh, ceramic horseshoe crabs that we make uh, down here. Um, and uh, it, But I am excited about this. And, I, you know, with the way things are in the world, that we've got, you know, uh, pop-up restaurants now and pop-up takeout uh, food places. And there's even a young lady uh, locally who does a, a, a pop-up uh, fashion business in a van. So, uh, and now Hawk Mountain being as innovative as you are, you're doing pop-up birding adventures. So, uh, uh, it's great to be uh, be part of that. So, um, I I should warn you the the uh, uh, the opinions expressed today are are mine and they're not uh, the institutes or uh, Hawk Mountain and uh, any uh, uh, damage I do to the uh, the language and mis mispronunciations of Spanish and Latin and English and and what Mark Twain. Uh, facetiously called that horrible French language. Uh, th those are all my faults. So uh, I'll take uh, take the blame for that. So um, I did, uh, I do have some notes for myself. I had keep reminding myself that the audience is birders here. So I'll try not to dwell too much on uh, things that aren't that. And I also uh, reminded myself to wear pants uh, so, uh, just in case, so, um, the, um, uh, presentation is, is much wordier than usual, uh, because, uh, you will be able to access this, uh, through the site again, uh, and I will skim over, um, slides that have a lot of writing on them and just tell you what the point of those are, uh, and then you can go back for that information, uh, if you, uh, if you like. Uh, most of it comes from uh, uh, websites, Audubon Society, and other groups uh, that are uh, involved in um, sustaining these uh, uh, populations of uh, shorebirds and all and studying them. Um, and uh, so there are various links that uh, uh, you may or may not be able to click on uh, when you go back to this, uh, but uh, uh, we will send out a list of the uh, of the references uh, as a follow up, and and I'm happy to answer any questions that we don't get to today if people want to email me. And there are several spots uh, here you can do that. So um, I think I've covered things uh, uh, liability wise, and uh, so we'll start uh, going through the presentation here and. Uh, Hopefully it'll work. We've got a little bit of a pause here. So there we go. Um, again, there are various quotes here and uh, you will be able to come back to this and I won't uh, spend the day reading quotes on there. But uh, as far as I'm concerned and a lot of um, marine biologists, there's, there's nothing more, more curious and interesting than horseshoe crabs. And uh, the second half of our presentation today uh, uh, I hope you will uh, uh, agree uh, with me. Um, down at the bottom here, uh, we also have other programs that we do. Uh, so I'm uh, doing just a little uh, plug for that. Uh, and we do do various programs uh, on sharks. Uh, one of my favorite is from my own experiences in island ecology and whatnot. There's a, a picture down at the bottom uh, there of uh, a Seychelle tortoise, the Esmeraldus, the largest tortoise in the world. And I'm the one with a hat on. Uh, and we'll go to uh, touch on some of these other places um, uh, today with uh, some of the slides. And again, if anyone has questions, uh, I'm happy to answer their emails. Um, and if you're interested in programs uh, at Hawk Mountain or otherwise, uh, please uh, let me know. So, all right, there. I'm, I am having trouble with changing slides here, so I'm just going to warn you that we might have to bounce back and forth a little bit. So, uh, John Hay, uh, a writer from Cape Cod, uh, 
uh, I had uh, done some work with uh, for many years, and uh, this is his quote, and uh, it really is uh, very valid that uh, uh, horseshoe crabs have been uh, maligned and tortured uh, by us over the years, uh, but they're uh, in the, in the world of science and, and bio uh, biomedicine and whatnot. There's there's uh, very few other creatures that are as interesting. So, and again, here's uh, here's my um, email address. Uh, so, um, in uh, like uh, uh, Mayor De Blasio and and it seems every politician these days, I'd like to say a few words in Spanish uh, when we start. And uh, uh, cucaracha is uh, a name that I picked up when I was in Florida, and there is a cockroach bay in um, near Tampa that, and the Spanish explorers uh, put the first name uh, out on the horseshoe crab. Uh, they called it uh, a cockroach, cucaracha. Uh, I've um, uh, met uh, Cuban Americans down in Florida, uh, and they call the uh, the horseshoe crab, uh, crangejo crab, which it's not a true crab, and uh, bayonetta, which of course refers to the tail. So, <clears throat> as we'll see, the, the horseshoe crab is it's not a true crab. It's it is an arthropod, but it's a, um, a, a it and uh, um, scorpions have a distant uh, relative in the fossil record. And then of course uh, the red knot and um, this is the um, Spanish uh, name of the red knot uh, down in South America, where I was earlier this year, um, and, and a translation of that, which uh, I, I kind of, I find interesting because uh, a lot of these shorebirds, like the knot and the uh, sanderling, um, the uh, market hunters on the East Coast 100 years ago used to call them uh, butter birds. Uh, and uh, because uh, they were so full of fat from gorging on horseshoe crabs uh, that when uh, they were literally, literally bursting with fat uh, when the hunters uh, shot them. And then down at the bottom, other names over the years that I picked up uh, for horseshoe crabs from various sources. Um, the um, uh, kabutagani is, is the Japanese uh, word. And there are three other species of horseshoe crabs in Asia. Uh, that, um, and they are harvested also. And the Japanese one is particularly threatened and endangered, uh, um, even though it's a, a something of a sacred animal there. Um, because of sea level rise uh, and development, the, the beaches in Japan are disappearing. And that, as we'll see, is the nesting grounds of horseshoe crabs, as well as the feeding grounds of shorebirds. So. And then uh, on the bottom in blue, and there's a link uh, of any of these uh, uh, words with uh, in blue and underlined uh, have links, um, is the Native American uh, term for the horseshoe crab. And we'll get to that later. And then two of many kids books about horseshoe crabs and red knots that you can uh, explore. So, cast of characters for today's program, uh, and I like to throw in a little bit of uh, language arts uh, with things that we do. Uh, and here's the, the name of the uh, red knot, and the source of that name goes all the way back to Aristotle. Um, it wasn't necessarily specifically a name about the red knot, but of shorebirds. And, uh, those of you that uh, go to Cape May in the fall looking for shorebirds, you, you know there are, uh, uh, there are three main species, the, uh, the gray ones, the white ones, and the gray and white ones. And uh, so they're all very difficult to uh, identify in the fall uh, because they've, uh, they've lost their breeding plumage. But we can see where Aristotle would perhaps think the same thing that all shorebirds are gray. And then of course, uh, King Canute, um, and uh, you probably, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the legend of, of uh, him uh, and holding back the tides. Uh, and then uh, horseshoe crab, uh, Limulus polyphemus, the side-looking side, side clops and that 
refers to one of the 10 sets of eyes, the compound eyes on the side of the head. And this is what I assume would be the horseshoe crab's view of the Sandy Hook lighthouse out of my old office window at the tip of Sandy Hook. Uh, and the compound dragonfly eye like this uh, might not be very good for, for necessarily recognizing anything, but, but I think it probably is good for detecting movement, uh, which would help it uh, avoid predators and, uh, and perhaps look for a mate on the beach in the spring. And then the last uh, character here, of course, uh, Homo sapiens uh, and the translation of our Latin there. And they, I, remains to be seen whether we're wise and, and sensible or not. Uh, okay, there we go. So, and speaking personally, uh, uh, that is me on the, uh, the upper left there. Uh, two, uh, three, three winters ago, I, I spent the winter at uh, Midway Island uh, with the um, albatross colony there. And uh, it's, Midway is near the uh, international dateline and about 1,500 miles west of Honolulu. So, uh, and then uh, two winters ago, I was in the South Atlantic and uh, the picture on the upper right and bottom left are from the uh, uh, Ascension Island, uh, not Ascension Island, I'm sorry, um, uh, Tristan da Cunha and St. Helena Islands uh, down off the coast of Africa. And then uh, the, one summer ago, I was uh, working on a boat up in uh, the Arctic, and uh, this is from the aquarium in Iceland. Uh, and there's a bit of a story about the, the birds here. The, uh, the fledglings, when they leave the, the burrow, uh, the puffling, pufflings, um, will fly towards streetlights and uh, end up on the street and the young Icelandic kids will collect them, put them in shoe boxes, bring them to the aquarium where they're checked out. Uh, and then the next day they're taken down to the water and released. So, and there's even a little book about that, that, uh, that I'm reading to the uh, puffins there called the pufflings. So, and um, I am not a great birder, uh, but I may be a, the luckiest birder you'll ever run into because uh, my work has allowed me to go to a lot of places um, and unusual places where I've been able to, uh, besides looking at plankton and marine life, uh, I've, I've been able to observe, study birds. So, so if I have a favorite group, they're terns. And uh, if uh, this, uh, we'll send you this link to chasing terns, a write-up that I uh, did about terns. But the uh, bird on the left is the uh, fairy tern uh, on Midway Island, although they're found all around the tropics. Um, the uh, Hawaiian name is uh, Manauku, Mana uh, and uh, it has been designated. You don't have to go to Midway Island to see them. Um, they, they do fly around in Honolulu, and uh, a decade ago, they were uh, designated the, the city bird of Honolulu. So you do, do see them there. And they are the tamest of the terns uh, and um, very approachable. They don't build a nest. They just lay their egg wherever they feel like it. And a really fascinating bird. And as you'll see later, I always wear a white hat when I'm uh, in areas like that because for some reason, terns are attracted to that. Fairy terns will come sit on your head or sit on your shoulder. They're uh, really quite uh, unusual for a tern. And then the upper right is the Inca tern. Uh, and uh, I got a good look at those um, years ago working on a ship um, out of Chile uh, when we were studying um, the uh, Humboldt current, um, the, uh, which is really the ground zero for seabirds. Um, and um, the Inca turn is unlike any other turn, so it's a lot of questions of which other ones it's related to. It's quite unique, uh, and this is an adult bird in the upper right there. And uh, in uh, first time I saw one was working on a ship in Peru, 
and um, the uh, Peruvians call it the, um, their local name is um, uh, Sario, uh, earring, referring to the, to the, the white feathers. Uh, and then uh, years later, uh, on a boat in Chile, I found that the, the, the local name is the uh, uh, Monas, uh, which uh, uh, is a nun. Uh, so I nicknamed them flying nun around the, uh, the boat. And then the bottom right is from St. Helena in the South Atlantic. And when I was down there, uh, I organized a, a, a local charter to go out to one of the nesting islands there. And there were a lot of British birders who were quite serious in the group. And they were hoping to see uh, a brown booby get it on their list. And this is a, a selfie uh, of me, uh, an attempt of a selfie uh, of uh, the uh, brown boobies, and you can see they're quite tame also. So. Uh, then uh, the first time I did a program on, um, I don't know why, uh, and I apologize for it, uh, that I have little control on this change of year. First time I did a program on uh, shorebirds and horseshoe crabs was actually up in Barrow, Alaska. I was invited up there and participated in a NASA program uh, doing other things. So the picture up on the left is uh, me on 4th of July in Barrow, Alaska at about 38 degrees. And the picture on the right is another visit uh, in winter uh, in January and February, and it was about 38 below there. Uh, and on the bottom right is the first sunrise of the year after 83 days of darkness in uh, February, and it was about 58 below then. So. And this is the one bird that, that I did see up there in the summer was the, the first time for me, the, the Baird's sandpiper um, there. And uh, a quick sidebar and, and anecdote, uh, this is a Baird's sandpiper also. Uh, and it was only the second time I had seen one, and it was in, uh, next to the parking lot on the top of Mount Washington. And I don't profess to be an expert on, on uh, shorebirds and, and bird identification, um, but I remembered from Barrow when I uh, wrote about that, that uh, I looked, uh, looked up for information on birds. And one of the notes was that it wintered in the highlands and mountains of South America. So I phoned our research director, Jennifer, down in Texas, uh, from there and um, inquired with her. I said, I don't have a bird book and I wondered about this bird. Long story short, by the time we got off the mountain and I got on the line and had gotten a picture to her, well, she'd spread it around and an hour later, there were all sorts of comments from other birders and insistence that I put the information on eBird, which I wasn't familiar with. Uh, but uh, with persistence, I finally did that. And, and Jamie, take note that uh, this was the first uh, sighting of Baird Sandpiper in the National Forest up in White Mountains. And uh, uh, New Hampshire Audubon uh, rewarded me with, oh, I think they sent me a calendar, and membership, all sorts of publications. So, uh, so you never know uh, where shorebirds are gonna lead you. So let's get back to the red knots and the, um, uh, all of the struggles they have. Uh, they nest in northern Canada, uh, northernmost Canada. Uh, they make epic flights of uh, over a thousand miles and just several big leaps going um, up the um, eastern seaboard uh, to breed. And they must uh, stock up on food in Delaware Bay by way of the horseshoe crabs, or they are not gonna have enough energy uh, to get to the Arctic. Uh, and if they do, they won't have enough fat stores to reproduce. And so the whole effort will be a, a waste. Uh, and we're gonna go over uh, that migration and, and threats to that in all. So um, the uh, shorebird populations uh, on the East Coast here, uh, in the last 50 years have uh, dropped about 50%, um, and which means they're 
probably 12, 12 million or more uh, that aren't flying out there that, uh, that you would have seen 50 years ago along our coast. Um, and so this is alarming. And some of the species are um, way down in population. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So I'm still trying to, there we go. Um, so again, I apologize for the um, changes here. Um, these are some of the spots uh, that I uh, have visited in the last year or so, uh, not just to look for red knots, but uh, for other reasons. But um, again, in upper left, they breed in uh, the uh, wet areas, tundra areas up in Arctic Canada, um, not quite uh, over to Alaska uh, for this subpopulation. Uh, Delaware Bay in the upper right, of course, uh, which is crucial. Uh, Baleem, uh, the mouth of um, uh, the Amazon, uh, is where I was uh, earlier in the year. And uh, as you'll see, I didn't have any luck finding red knots there. But in the bottom uh, right, in uh, Tierra del Fuego, um, they do concentrate uh, in great numbers in uh, several places, including uh, Bialomas, which we'll see in maps later. So. Um, all right, we'll keep trying to change slides here. This is Merritt Island, the causeway at Merritt Island out to Cape Kennedy. And um, this is, uh, uh, this picture is from February. Uh, and the horseshoe crabs are breaking two rules here. Uh, one about uh, um, social distancing. Uh, and uh, they are in uh, uh, groups here breeding, laying eggs. Uh, the other is they're breaking the, the biologist rule that we think of horseshoe crabs as coming in on the full and new moon, the spring tides to spawn. Uh, but these crabs are instead coming in when the wind, winter winds change and uh, the uh, waters of uh, uh, the bays there sash and pile up as they would on a spring tide. Uh, and so they seem to be out of sequence with uh, the moon, unlike most of the other crabs on the uh, East Coast. And there are a variety of crabs here, and I hope that uh, you can get down to Delaware Bay or Sandy Hook Bay uh, and see the spawning um, some year. Uh, there are different sizes here. The different colors are related to the age of the crab and whether it's uh, uh, covered with barnacles and, and uh, other creatures. And we'll talk about those hitchhikers uh, as we go on farther. So uh, uh, farther down, I was able to, uh, don't know why it does that. And again, I apologize. Um, the, uh, was able to, to visit some of the Caribbean islands on the way to, uh, to the Amazon uh, this spring uh, or winter rather. Um, this is uh, St. Kitts in the upper left and you can see some wetlands there. Uh, and uh, red knots and other shorebirds rely on those wetlands um, to, to uh, carry them over. And some of them uh, don't go all the way to Tierra del Fuego. They will winter along our Gulf Coast and uh, the Caribbean islands. Uh, the bad news is that two things. Uh, many of these islands, they've lost 90% of their wetlands. And, but even worse, um, they uh, still hunt uh, shorebirds. Uh, that migrate through there. And uh, um, places like uh, islands like Barbado, which I think we'll, we'll see in a bit, um, that the hunters will take 25 or 30,000 shorebirds a year. Uh, not necessarily red knots, but uh, you know, there are whatever 51 species would get along the eastern seaboard. And um, apparently they're, uh, they're all targets to hunters. So. Um, the bottom picture is, is from French Guiana. And actually, that's uh, Devil's Island. Uh, and I have to learn some local languages when I'm looking for birds and other things. So, uh, and this is the French uh, 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 word for the, uh, for the red knot, uh, which basically just translated means red, red shore bird. Um, but, uh, but I didn't see red knots there uh, either. I did see on the bottom left, uh, uh, a um, spotted uh, sandpiper in uh, uh, in winter plumage, uh, and you would recognize it if it were up our way in the summer, 
uh, in its breeding plumage with its speckled uh, breast. The, um, but the, uh, and the local name, uh, uh, in the French name in Guyana there is uh, uh, Chevalier, uh, which uh, means knight. Um, so I, I, that's a, a lot nicer than the Latin name that we have for it, the, uh, which is uh, uh, Act Actida, I believe it is. Yeah, the genus. Anyway, back to um, knots and horseshoe crabs. Uh, the horseshoe crabs are the, the keystone species uh, in Delaware Bay, especially. Uh, many things feed on horseshoe crab eggs, uh, as well as horseshoe crabs themselves. Uh, and loggerhead turtles and dusky sharks uh, are said to uh, occasionally eat the adults. Everything eats the eggs, as we'll see in some of these pictures. Uh, and uh, in the upper right, you can see a horseshoe crab that uh, has a tag on it. And there's a lot of citizen science that is in, uh, involving horseshoe crabs now, uh, where uh, uh, any of us can go out with groups and tag the crabs to study their population changes and all. So uh, if we were doing this with a live audience, I, I, I would say I, I try to participate the audience. And when we see birds, I try to quiz the audience on it uh, in part to see how how threatening my audience can be, whether how serious the birders are in the group. Uh, so that's why there are a, a lot of various pictures uh, here. Is uh, uh, all right. We're going to try again. There we go. So we're back to looking at maps. Uh, if you take a cruise to Antarctica or South Georgia Island, uh, you'll leave from the tip of South America in the bottom right. Uh, you'll either leave from Punta Arenas, uh, one of the most interesting South American towns, uh, or um, Ushuaia in Argentina. Uh, in either case, you have access to uh, Bialomas, uh, which is a major wintering area and a concentration point for the Red Knots. There is oil development down uh, at this end of South America, and the, the Part of South America that shows the most promise now for future oil development is French Guiana, which uh, we just visited before, which is another major stopover area for the knots. So, uh, so there are uh, many, many uh, threats to uh, the knots and um, other shorebirds uh, in their epic journeys from um, South America up to the Arctic. Uh, there are creatures that prey upon them all, all along the way. Uh, falcons, people, hunting, uh, 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 other animals uh, harvesting them for food, uh, along with uh, competing with their food source, the, uh, the horseshoe crab eggs. And uh, again, oil spills. So it really is a, 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 a miracle, uh, the whole process of their life cycle, uh, and but but also in addition, the fact that they're managing to survive uh, with all of these challenges. Uh, Delaware Bay uh, horseshoe crabs and red knots have become a a great tourist attraction and uh, help support the economy of a lot of those small towns along the bay that uh, otherwise uh, would not necessarily be attracting tourists who would much rather go to the ocean beaches. So, um, okay, so a little history. If we go way back, uh, there is evidence of dinosaurs that uh, fed on horseshoe crabs uh, on their nesting beaches. Uh, and if we go back a century, uh, millions and millions of horseshoe crabs were harvested every year on uh, Delaware Bay and uh, to a lesser extent up in Raritan Bay, low, lower New York Harbor, for horseshoe crabs. And they were used for uh, fertilizer, chicken feed, and bait. And they're still used for bait today um, by uh, uh, fishermen who are uh, trapping uh, conch, uh, the, the whelk, um, and um, uh, eels, which are very important uh, 
as an export commodity to Asia and Europe. Uh, so uh, when I first worked at Sandy Hook many years ago, uh, a school bus driver uh, mentioned to me that uh, when he was a kid in the 50s, uh, farmers from Freehold, uh, which is about a, a 20 miles away by, uh, by mule cart from uh, Keensburg and Belford on Raritan Bay, uh, farmers used to bring their wagons up and uh, harvest horseshoe crabs from Sandy Hook Bay to take back to grow melons. Um, they dig a hole, crack the horseshoe crab with a stick, uh, bury it, and then plant uh, melons on the mound over that. Uh, they were used at much greater extent in uh, Delaware Bay um, and, and still are harvested by the millions uh, there. So. Uh, a little more history of uh, the, the horseshoe crabs. The, um, uh, and again, you can refer back to this when you, when you uh, look at this again. Uh, different prices over the years of horseshoe crabs, uh, both for feed and fertilizer, uh, but also uh, as a predator that was uh, hunted in places like Cape Cod, uh, where a bounty was put on the tail because horseshoe crabs feed on worms and baby shellfish. And the fishermen felt that the horseshoe crabs were destroying their, um, their clam um, beds. And uh, therefore the, uh, the state of Massachusetts would offer a bounty uh, for the crabs. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, you can see a picture uh, of a, a poster uh, that I first saw up at Acadia National Park in Maine. Uh, and this is a, a picture from the French explorers, of, uh, Jacques Carrier, I believe, uh, the artist on uh, his cruise uh, of the, um, I think these are the Wampanoag um, Indians from Cape Cod. Uh, but at the bottom uh, left of it, you can see a horseshoe crab there. And we've already gone over the horseshoe crab Native American name. And uh, presumably, they wouldn't name something if it wasn't of value to them uh, as food or otherwise. And I have uh, seen general interest articles, of people, including myself, stating that the, the Indians may have used the tail as a spearhead. Uh, I've never, uh, never seen that documented in a scientific paper, but... It, I will reach out to uh, our observers today. If anybody has that information, I'll gladly receive it. So, so uh, every presentation has to have some data and graph, and here it is. Uh, the point being uh, here that uh, the horseshoe crabs uh, and their eggs are uh, full of protein and fat, uh, and they're exactly what the birds need for uh, that boost on that last step of their thousand mile journey to the Arctic from Raritan Bay, or from Delaware Bay too. So, um, besides the, the, the blue blood of the horseshoe crab, there have been many other discoveries related to horseshoe crabs. Uh, and these have to do mostly with the vision and the nerves. Uh, they're a great research uh, specimen. Uh, a, a biologist uh, that uh, I knew from uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, who uh, interested me in horseshoe crabs, uh, worked on the, uh, the optic nerve uh, from that compound eye, that very large compound eye to the very small brain uh, is quite large. And, uh, excuse me, just one second. I had a timer going, so I didn't go on too long. I apologize. Um, he first introduced me to how rugged they are. Uh, he needed to keep them for long periods uh, and didn't have aquarium space. He would just put them on a shelf and they'd curl up and he'd spray them with a little water once in a while and they'd be just fine. Uh, when he needed to work on them, he'd throw them in a tank and uh, they'd uh, crawl away like uh, nothing had happened. So uh, getting back to the eyes, the, the eyes are, are, are said to be a thousand times uh, more sensitive than ours. And something to think about if you're down there looking for horseshoe crabs nesting at night. If you flash your, your flashlight on them, it probably 
blinds them for about 24 hours. So, um, and, and they're, uh, again, the Nobel Prize uh, quality research has gone into the horseshoe crab. So. Uh, the next batch of slides have a lot of writing on them, and I will encourage you to go back and, and look at that. I've just uh, uh, put in red the, the main point of, of each of these slides uh, in that the, the crabs uh, need them, or rather the, the birds need them to fuel their migration. Uh, and the um, uh, adult crabs uh, are used uh, as a, a very important bait source for the fishermen for eels and conch. So uh, again, I'm going to, to zip through these uh, uh, quickly. Uh, and here's a red knot holding. Uh, the eggs clump up when the, when the female comes in and lays them. They, they clump up in, in uh, sticky clumps, a, bit, a little smaller than a, about half the size of a golf ball. And she'll lay about 8,000 of them uh, at a time and then come back in on the next tide and lay more. Uh, they... Um, Again, I would encourage you to come back uh, and, uh, and read some of this on your own. Uh, the important points here is that the red knot population is plunging, uh, and um, uh, even at its low numbers, is is varying up and down uh, precariously. So I'm going to try and get through these. There we go. Oop. So uh, there are uh, many other species of, of um, shorebirds that feed on the crabs, and it's, uh, it's a great time to, to go down to Delaware Bay to learn your identification of the different shorebirds uh, uh, that are also feeding on the crabs there and, and are approaching their, uh, their breeding plumage. So they're much more recognizable than in the fall. So uh, regional threats, I talked about that before. Uh, this is one of the places I stopped um, this winter, uh, Chancery Marsh, uh, which they down there they call a shooting swamp, which is where the hunters will shoot shorebirds. Again, that's bad news, and even worse news is that this represents uh, about 90% of the wetlands down there have been destroyed for development tourist actions. So, uh, uh, the future of, the, of, the, of the, the red knot is tied to the future of our limiting the horse, the horseshoe crab harvest uh, and other factors. Some of the good news, the U.S. Postal Service recognized the uh, red knot there with uh, one of their stamps, a postcard stamp. Uh, there are lots of people doing education about horseshoe crabs um, at Sandy Hook. Um, the... Um, uh, you can visit a world famous Horseshoe Cove named after the horseshoe crabs that breed there in the spring. So, um, I believe Don Reapy up at uh, Jamaica Bay in New York um, took this picture um, and loaned it to me, whether he knows it or not. But uh, they do a horseshoe crab festival uh, around May 20th every year. Hopefully that will go uh, this year. And it's uh, a good concentration point for um, the red knots and other shorebirds, and they will do lectures and field trips out of there also for that. So that's worth looking into. Uh, again, a shorebird quiz, uh, which we would do if we had the audience uh, today. Uh, again, I'm losing all control of the... the uh... Oh, well, here we go. Uh, this is what it lo looks like. Uh, when uh, the tide comes in and those horseshoe crab eggs have been sitting in the sand for, for two weeks, uh, they, I'm hoping this video will work for us. There we go. They will start to crawl out of the sand and they are on their own for the next uh, 10 or 11 years until they um, uh, reach adult size. Uh, and if they're lucky, about one and they, the thought is about one in 80,000 will survive to adulthood. So there's so many things that feed on them. And they'll spend about a week in the plankton too. So fish and other things are eating them. Okay. Oh, and this, let's see if the other video will work here.
I was a little worried that what if the videos would work or not uh, on this, so, but here they are, and you can see um, some are actually swimming now and have uh, pulled themselves out of their eggs. So, so uh, this is a close up of a horseshoe crab um, that's um, a few weeks old. It has a tail. Uh, when they're in the egg, they don't have the tail. Uh, they have to shed first to get their tail. Well, it looks like little spaghetti strands there is the yolk. Uh, and they're quite durable. They can live, uh, as it turns out, I uh, found for many months uh, before they have to feed, relying on that, uh, on that egg yolk. We'll see if this one, little video works here. So there's a, a, a week or so old hatchling. Um, they tend to um, stay on their backs in the Petri dishes when we have them uh, or study them uh, there when they're not swimming around. So here's a little closer up. This is uh, uh, with a little magnifying glass and my iPad, uh, closer up view. And you can see this one has no tail. So this is a fresh hatchling. Uh, these are some videos that may or may not work. If uh, um, you can see, if you follow my cursor, um, there are some sh uh, shed eggshells. There are eggs here. Um, and you'll see two types of crabs in these pictures. Some are just out of the egg and they have no tail. And others are um, a little larger and have their tails. So you can see both sizes there. And this is just scooped up from the beach uh, and uh, a little field shot of them so all right so we're trying to continue okay a little more language arts before we go and you can go back and refer to that uh, at your leisure um, the um, horseshoe crab again is uh, we feel is probably a distant relative with the scorpions uh, in their earliest uh, relatives in the fossil record um, and the um, the latin uh, name of the class and order here. Uh, again, we've talked about this and how important the eye is for uh, research uh, in uh, neurobiology. So uh, again, a, uh, uh, the main point on this slide is that the horseshoe crab is the, the dominant benthic predator, bottom predator uh, in our estuaries in the summer. And it's feeding on worms and baby shellfish, and if it comes across a dead fish, it'll uh, nibble on that too. And down at the very bottom, some of the things that I've uh, studied uh, on them is uh, how uh, uh, resilient they are. Um, they can um, survive in water that is almost fresh water in the uppermost part of the estuary to hypersaline conditions that are saltier than the ocean. Uh, and can survive for at least short periods. And wide temperature ranges, um, the, the eggs still survive and hatch uh, there. So, um, they're important in planetary health. Um, years ago, I was uh, working on a project out in California, uh, and one of the uh, people involved was involved in uh, planetary safety and health. Uh, whenever we send anything to uh, uh, into space that we feel might end up in a, a place like Mars or the Jovian moons where there may be primitive uh, uh, life, uh, it gets tested with horseshoe crab blood to make sure it doesn't have any um, uh, bacterial contamination. Uh, so uh, the horseshoe crab blood is one of the procedures uh, and uh, mechanisms that are used to uh, uh, test things before they go into space. So again, bird quizzes again, if we had a live audience, in case you were wondering what the eggs look like, there are some freshly laid eggs in my hand. They're tiny. They uh, almost double in size after uh, two weeks, uh, just before the, the embryos hatch. Um, this is, I believe the picture on the right is from an old Herbert Zinn um, science book. Uh, and uh, it's the oldest type picture I could find of a horseshoe crab uh, that I came across of those. 
It was quite interesting from the 50s. And then there's somebody who looks suspiciously like me uh, up at Mystic Aquarium doing a workshop on horseshoe crabs. And again, uh, we will, uh, if these links do not come through for you, uh, for different groups and materials, we'll send those out to you. Um, when you visit friends and you say they have a nice cat, just to be polite, uh, the same thing happens with horseshoe crabs. Uh, if, you, if you're into horseshoe crabs, people send you things about horseshoe crabs. And I wish I knew who this kid is, to give credit to whoever made this, this costume. Uh, but uh, this has been going around since Halloween, and lots of people have, have sent it to me. So, um, again, we have worked over the years trying to teach people as much as we can uh, out at Sandy Hook about horseshoe crabs and how valuable they are. Um, we've participated in, in uh, different research projects involving them. Uh, and one, one of the more interesting things I came across was uh, Nicholas Tesla uh, used the horseshoe crab shape as a design for his early uh, radio-controlled boat. Uh, these are pictures from another colleague down in Florida, uh, Dr. Uh, Brockman at the University of Florida. Uh, horseshoe crabs are an ancient creature. Um, they're various species that have evolved over the years, the millions of years, uh, but they're all recognizable as horseshoe crabs. The um, uh, crea creationists uh, use the horseshoe crab as, a, as a, their proof that uh, there's no such thing as evolution uh, because horseshoe crabs don't appear to have changed much, but all these fossils, uh, Creatures are a little bit different in different species, and our local one, uh, Limulus, appeared rather suddenly in the um, fossil record, just about the time the um, the Atlantic Ocean began to uh, open up, about 150 million years ago. But other species go back, again, um, over 400 million years. So lots of art and literature, kids' books, uh, and again, we'll send you. Uh, uh, follow-up uh, links for that if you like. If you're if you're going to Cape May around May 20th for the peak of the sh uh, horseshoe crab spawning and the um, shorebirds, uh, just as you go over the bridge into Cape May is a restaurant there, Lucky Bones. This is not a commercial endorsement, uh, but uh, the Lucky Bones referred to the clasper fin uh, um, uh, clasper claw of the male horseshoe crab, which Cape May fishermen uh, carry as a good luck charm when they go offshore. And then in the bottom right, uh, again, the um, horseshoe crab in Japan is considered a, a sacred animal. Uh, and you can see the uh, helmet of the uh, uh, samurai warrior is fashioned after the horseshoe crab. So, uh, I, have gotten into ceramics over the years, and my favorite uh, um, topic is the horseshoe crab. And I, of their fragile shed shells, I have been making um, uh, uh, casting uh, the, the various sizes that they get larger. I'm almost up to year 10 now. So, And uh, this is uh, uh, Carl Schuster, the former director of the uh, University of Delaware lab down in uh, Lewis, Delaware, and the world authority on horseshoe crabs with a t-shirt that I made up for him. So um, again, we'll, we'll shorten up the, the reading issues here, but I will point out another favorite quote from Bill Hall at the University of Delaware. Um, when they drop the bomb, two things will survive, cockroaches and horseshoe crabs. And they really are a, uh, an amazing creature and uh, incredible uh, um, that they have endured so long and are still managing to survive even uh, with um, all the problems we create for them. So um, we'll get through these quickly. Here's somebody who looks suspiciously like me down at the bloodletting lab for horseshoe crab blood. I was not down there to get blood, uh, although uh, here's something I show kids. Uh, the, the blue blood of the crab. Um, 
what I was looking for, in, among other things, was where these crabs were coming from. And here's the lucky bone, the front claw of a male crab. And you will never see this as it is. Um, this portion is missing when you find the crab on the beach because it snaps off the first time they grab onto a female to spawn. Uh, so this, uh, the, the crabs there were uh, virgin unmated crabs, which um, were a clue to me that they were being dredged from offshore. They weren't getting them from the beach. Uh, fishermen were dredging them out of deep water. Again, not a commercial endorsement, but uh, Lucky Bones is, uh, uh, is the restaurant uh, down in Cape May uh, for that. So uh, hopefully you don't find these too disturbing. The uh, biomedical industry claims that they uh, remove uh, only about 30% of the crab blood before it is returned to the water. Uh, but you can see the famous blue oxygenated blood of the horseshoe crab. Sterile conditions, of course. And uh, it still uh, garners about $20,000 a pint uh, for its use in the uh, biomedical uh, industry. It's uh, one of our most sensitive tests for the, for the presence of bacterial contamination. Uh, endotoxins that are given off by uh, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, and it's uh, thought to be about a thousand times more sensitive than our blood in detecting and reacting to that, so it's it's quite important uh, in the medical industry, and anything that gets injected in, in the human body, uh, uh, any uh, anything that's placed in the body, uh, a, a new hip, uh, a heart valve, they're all tested with horseshoe crab blood uh, for possible contamination. And in the upper right, you can see a little bit of white powder uh, there, and that is the processed uh, limulus lysate. The amoeba site, the blood cell, uh, burst and dried out. And rather than testing something with a nice fluffy white rabbit uh, and hurting that, uh, with the horseshoe crab blood, you just need uh, a half a milliliter, literally a tiny drop of material to put in here. And it, within 20 minutes, uh, if it's um, contaminated with uh, gram negative bacteria, uh, it will uh, it will react and clot up. Um, so um, it's a it's a fabulous uh, service to humanity. So uh, here's our requisite cartoon that every presentation should have, uh, and this is a bit of an exaggeration. And we are in the home stretch here. Um, the uh, porphyrin molecule is um, uh, illustrated here. It's uh, it's a carbon cyclic molecule and there's nothing in the middle in this picture but if you put an iron molecule in the middle you get hemoglobin and hemoglobin is red because of the iron molecule there and of course we can't live without hemoglobin if you uh, put magnesium in the center there you have chlorophyll which we can't live without because that's how plants produce uh, their energy these are what are called uh, uh, metal organic uh, compounds. And if you insert a copper atom there on this little um, odd piece of jewelry that I uh, came across, you have hemocyanin, which is the, uh, the blood uh, of the horseshoe crab. So, and again, very important in nature. Uh, curious that it's uh, the same chemical structure on uh, plants uh, and animals. Um, uh, this is not the uh, coronavirus, don't be frightened. Uh, this is a model of the um, hemocyanin with our um, copper uh, atom right in the middle. And then you can refer back to this uh, uh, hemoglobin picture. This is where the oxygen attaches in our blood, hemoglobin. So, Dr. Schuster, on one of his many presentations down in Delaware on horseshoe crabs, uh, and uh, various groupies annoying him and uh, covering him with questions. Um, the, uh, if, if you, uh, his um, latest book is from uh, Harvard University Press, The American Horseshoe Crab, and uh, everything you need to know about horseshoe crabs, uh, scientifically and otherwise, is in there. And, uh, terrific guy, uh, always very uh, 
helpful and willing to speak to any group in any age group about horseshoe crabs. One last little bit of things we do at, horse, at um, Sandy Hook, uh, a um, puzzle, uh, it's always been puzzling how long horseshoe crabs live uh, because they shed their shell each year as they grow till about eight, 11 years. Uh, and, but then you don't know after that. Uh, however, they collect a lot of hitchhikers, uh, epibionts, uh, that um, form a living reef and travel with the horseshoe crab on their shell. And this is a slipper shell. And the slipper shell on the bottom here uh, was the first one to attach the horseshoe crab. And it was a male. And as it got older, it changed into a female, which then attracted a another male out of the plankton, a microscopic plankton uh, larva, which landed on that. So now we have a couple. Uh, over time, that turned into a female. After a year, another male, another male, another male. So if we assume the horseshoe crab stopped shedding in 11 years, the bottom one would re represent year 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and little and 19 here. And so there are clues to us that the horseshoe crab lives about 20 years. And this is the slipper shell. And you probably found these on the beach, not live, but they uh, they usually call them boat shells too down in Delaware. So. Horseshoe crab larva, great to work with because the, the clear um, egg that you can uh, look in and see them rotating in there before they hatch. Notice there's no tail. Uh, here are some um, specimens uh, of different colors. Dr. Schuster, uh, when I showed these to him, thought maybe they were um, might have a, a, a fungus or, or some problem with them. Uh, uh, they did not survive. Uh, so these are various pictures uh, of eggs that I took uh, different ways under the microscope to kind of get a feel for what's going on. You can see um, two sets of their 10 eyes there. And in the bottom right, the egg yolk there and an egg, deformed egg. Um, and we did, we did an extensive project uh, on uh, horseshoe, using horseshoe crab eggs. Um, and um, uh, one of our um, um, teachers, um, uh, Caitlin Guzzi and uh, Dr. Loveland up at um, Rutgers, um, uh, we set it up down at Sandy Hook. We took water from the different tributaries that, that enter um, New York Harbor and Raritan Bay and raised horseshoe crab eggs in those different waters to see if uh, there were uh, any deformities that uh, occurred in the eggs and as to whether the horseshoe crabs uh, might, uh, the eggs might be used as a pollution indicator since some of those tributaries are relatively uh, clean and others have uh, landfills and all. So, um, and uh, things worked out pretty well. Uh, the, um, and these are deformities from um, um, some of the samples. The, um, the, the bad news appears that, that you're always going to get a form of deformities, uh, no matter what they're raised in. And, uh, but there were less than 1% uh, would, uh, would not develop properly like this. There's, they were still alive, but obviously couldn't uh, function. Um, but um, there, there may be other uses uh, that uh, other researchers can use them for. So this one, uh, when we uh, finished the, uh, we did the, the project in the summer with eggs that were, were hatched in May. And uh, when I was cleaning up the lab in December, months later, I found a Petri dish that still had a horseshoe crab larva in it, including this one, and uh, obviously a deformity, and it had survived all that time, even though it probably could not feed. But it looked oddly familiar to me, and after a while I realized it must be either Kang or Kong, or, or Kodos, rather, from The Simpsons. So, so we're wrapping it up here. Uh, here are some more links. Uh, and uh, on May 20th or thereabouts, you should be down at Horseshoe Cove at Sandy Hook, if it's open, uh, or uh, Cape May or uh, Delaware. 
uh, and looking for horseshoe crabs and shorebirds. Uh, and a good place is uh, Slaughter Beach down um, on the Delaware uh, coast there. Um, here are other references. Uh, and again, we'll send you these links uh, and you'll uh, know as much or more than I will about shorebirds and horseshoe crabs um, if you uh, visit those. Um, and um, we hope to see you on September 27th up at Hawk Mountain, uh, where we're going to meet the world's oldest albatross. And this is me three years ago at um, Midway Island doing uh, my Christmas count there. Um, I, it was not the best Christmas count ever. I had a dozen species, uh, one gull, one peregrine falcon, uh, but I made it up in numbers. I had 235,000 lace and albatross. So I'll ask you to top that on your Christmas count. So uh, thank you again for enduring this. I hope that you uh, all learned a little bit uh, about horseshoe crabs and, uh, and uh, uh, shorebirds and, uh, and the environment. Uh, and I'm hoping we still have a bit of time uh, to um, if there if if anybody's still awake or there and has questions, I'm I'm happy to try and answer them. So, thank you, Dave. That was a fascinating, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. We have so many questions from the audience, and first, I actually wanted to share a comment uh, from the chat from one of the viewers um, who works for the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. So he wanted to share that um, if people are interested in learning more about being involved in the tagging process of horseshoe crabs, that you can partner with some scientific organizations such as the Partnership for Delaware Estuary and the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Um, he just wanted to share that, um, that there is required training. Yeah. And those are great groups. groups. Yeah. Okay, so many questions, let's dive in. Um, Dave, is it illegal to pick up uh, horseshoe crab shells on the beach if the animal is no longer in the shell? Uh, no, uh, it's, it's not illegal. Um, I will warn you, if it's recently dead, there is nothing that smells worse than a horseshoe crab. And if you put it in your trunk and forget it uh, and go home, uh, you, you may have to sell the car afterwards. So um, the thing to look for in July, typically, are the shed skins of the horseshoe crab. And I had a picture or two of them, and they're quite thin and papery. Uh, and again, I make casts of those. Um, and uh, those are uh, like your fingernail. They're just, uh, they're inert. Um, they're very pure chitin, um, but they're very fragile. And I just rinse them gently in fresh water and put them in a, um, a container and uh, take those home. Uh, I would not recommend taking, unless you have a specific reason, I wouldn't take uh, dead adult horseshoe crabs. Plus, um, if they haven't been torn apart yet already, they're going to be food for seagulls. And they'll rip out those gulls very quickly, or the uh, gills rather. Uh, so I think I answered the question. So, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, next question. I saw on one of the slides that efforts to increase the horseshoe crab population have been unsuccessful so far. Can you please explain what is what has been or is being tried and why the efforts have been unsuccessful? Well, um, some of that information is, is uh, probably a little dated, but um, the, uh, and I'll try not to drag this out too much because that, that, that's a whole lecture in itself. Um, the crabs historically have been harvested off the beach and more recently trawled up uh, uh, in fishnets by fishermen. Um, for better or for worse, to the fishermen's credit, they're always one step ahead of the laws and regulations. So if, uh, for example, uh, when Delaware wanted to stop allowing the fishermen to bring in nets full of horseshoe crabs, the fishermen just started to land the horseshoe crabs up in uh, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, where there was no regulation. Um, so up and down the East Coast, as I said, the, the fishermen are always uh, one step ahead of it. But uh, the, the states have caught on over the last 15 years and have instituted uh, uh, regulations and catches. 
Uh, Delaware Bay has been terrific. And uh, one of the things uh, they have uh, tried to institute or suggested, uh, and I apologize because I'm not always up to speed on these things, but uh, one thought is uh, uh, instead of having fishermen and the biomedical uh, industry both out catching crabs, uh, have the, um, after the crabs are bled and they're probably weakened, then give those to the fishermen. Um, so now you don't have two people catching crabs, you just have the, the fishermen taken. The fishermen will freeze them, cut them in half, and then put them in their traps uh, for bait. Uh, it, it, so that's good news. Bad news is everybody wants the female crabs because they're full of eggs, and that's what attracts the eels and the birds and the, uh, and the, uh, the conchs uh, to feed on them. Um, so uh, if, you, um, if you go online, you can get much more up-to-date information on, uh, on the, the rules and regulations uh, of the horseshoe crabs. And w when we worked with them and the eggs and all, uh, uh, I would always, uh, uh, the college, we'd have a, uh, a permit from our uh, New Jersey Fish and Game uh, to collect certain amounts and uh, to uh, to work with them, and and as I think I uh, stated there, no horseshoe crabs were harmed in this presentation. I did see we, that. Yeah. yeah, we would we would let them let them go after we uh, worked with them for a month or so and and learned what we needed uh, to do. And I will throw in one one other thing. I, again, they're incredibly hardy, and to use as a research creep creature, I have kept them in the, ref the eggs in the sand in the refrigerator for an entire year and just took some out each month and they would hatch instantly. Um, so uh, again, like Bill Hall said, when they drop the bomb, you know, horseshoe crabs are, are going to make it uh, uh, along with uh, cockroaches. So. Thank you. All right, next question. Any progress with the development and use of an artificial substitute for horseshoe crab blood for medical purposes? That, that's a great question. And uh, uh, like politicians and Pentagon generals, when they don't know the answer to something, I'll just say, that's an absolutely fantastic question. Uh, I uh, did not have time to follow up on the latest on that. Uh, my experience in the last 20 years has been that this uh, blood alternative has been um, kind of like fusion energy. It's always 20 years away. Uh, but um, uh, most recently, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, as I understand it, has gotten approval from the FDA. And that's one of the things that has held up the artificial uh, uh, LAL uh, that uh, there has been FDA approval to use it. Um, so I believe that, uh, uh, and if so, that's going to save a million crabs a year. So Thank again, you. Uh, online, I, you can probably get uh, much more updated information. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, and we are running out of time, but I'm just going to uh, end with one more question. Um, how do horseshoe crabs communicate with each other? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> that, that's a neat question. Uh, I, and uh, I have a program on that. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, the females will, will crawl perpendicular to the beach. And when a male finds her and grabs onto her on the back with his lucky bones, that stimulates her to turn in and come up on the beach and begin to dig her, her nest there. Um, and uh, when they are uh, uh, generally on any beach, you will see more males than females. Uh, and there may be a female with one male uh, clipped onto her or two or three or more clustered around her and trying to clip on. Um, and uh, it, it may be a combination of them seeing the males seeing the shape and moving towards that, the shape of the female. Uh, which I guess is not unusual even in, in humans. Uh, but uh, the, uh, 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 and also uh, presumably uh, the female is giving off pheromones uh, and scents uh, 
again, that she is gravid and full of eggs. And of course, the, the scent of the eggs is what attracts them as a bait creature too. Um, having said that, uh, I have seen, uh, and I have horseshoe crab uh, pictures of male horseshoe crabs clinging onto a rock on the shoreline. Uh, another one uh, clinging on to a dead terrapin turtle. Uh, so there may be a lot of confusion there during the, uh, I, I was trying not to use the term orgy, but the, uh, the, the excitement of the spawning uh, episode there uh, during those two or three uh, 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 nights during the spring tides when they're uh, frantically all trying to, to nest and mate. So, uh, well, I hope, hopefully I won't get slapped for that past comment. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you so much. Um, just such a fascinating presentation again, your wealth of knowledge. Um, so thank you so much, Dave, for joining us. And to our wonderful audience, thank you for joining us today. Again, I apologize. There were so many wonderful questions. We didn't have time to get through all, all of them. But as Dave mentioned, please feel free to uh, stay in contact with him through email. And hopefully uh, he could answer some of the questions that we didn't get to today. Yep. Um, thank you again, Dave. Sounds great. And Thank you. <laughs> and we, we look forward to hopefully having Dave back at Hawk Mountain on September 27th for his presentation, Albatrosses of the World, uh, which is part of our Discovery Institute series. So I'm looking forward to that. Other um, virtual programming that we have uh, coming up in the next week include Earth Day, Wednesday, April 22nd, Be a Wildlife Hero at 1 o'clock p.m. and Rosalie Edge, The Tie That Binds at 7 o'clock p.m. On April 29th, we have Meet the Kestrel at 1 o'clock p.m. And on Friday, May 1st, we have Golden Eagles in your virtual classroom at 4 o'clock p.m. On Sunday, May 3rd, we have Rachel Carson, Inspiration, Legacy, and Challenge at 2 o'clock p.m. And don't forget, kids, there's still time to submit an entry in our Earth Day art contest, and you can see our website and Facebook event page for more details on that. Dave, thanks again so much. You were Thank fantastic. You. Um, hope to see everyone again soon. Bye for now. In September. Yes, bye. Bye. <laughs>